Good morning. So good to be with you this morning. Praise God for the results of uh, the preservation of uh, Donald Trump's life. And we give our uh, prayers uh, to those uh, who were shot and may the Lord uh, protect them. It's true in our world, uh, every thought of their heart is only evil continually. Uh, we have to uh, seek God himself and receive forgiveness of our sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, to cause us to love God and to cause us uh, to want to serve him with a whole heart and to be those uh, who honor him uh, by spreading his truth. I take us to Noah this morning, if you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, uh, because of the evil in the world and God's intolerance of it, it became so overwhelming uh, that he decided to judge man. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. This is the first time uh, it's introduced to us, uh, these so-called sons of God. They're powerful human rulers who were demon-possessed. They were indwelt by what had originally been angels who fell in rebellion against the Lord and came to earth and tried to manage and rule the earth by possessing uh, powerful leaders here on earth. They were called the mighty men, the men of renown. Uh, in Ezekiel 28 and Daniel 10, uh, you have examples of great kings who have princes ruling behind them. These are the demons with demonic power, giving power to human leaders. This rampant violation corrupted the world. The sons of God are not divine. Uh, they were demon-controlled, and they married women as they wished to satisfy their baser instincts. They were thought of as heroes, but they were human and eventually died just as uh, humans do. Verse 5, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And this next line is something that we feel almost today that every intent of their thoughts, of their heart, was only evil continually. We know people like that. We see people like that here on earth who are completely controlled with evil. It was so rampant that the Lord was sorry that he'd made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. He might say, but, but God is the creator. God knows everything. God knows the future. Why would he create man if this was what was going to happen to man? And the answer is, this is all part of God's plan to glorify himself in his desire to create beings in his image, creating man in his image that he wants to have rule over the earth. And it's his desire that we would find faith in his son, Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for us, dying in our place on the cross to pay for our sins, and that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember, the disciples didn't want Jesus to leave, and he said, it's for your advantage that I go away, because the Father will send the Spirit. And it's more than just being adjacent to Jesus Christ or hearing his teaching. We have God himself in the third person, the Holy Spirit, indwelling us personally and guiding us in the way in which we should live. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. He was sorry that he'd made man. So verse 7, he says, I'll destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air, for I'm sorry I've made them. But in contrast, you notice he says, but Noah found grace 
in the eyes of the Lord. Grace is God's favor upon us that we have not earned. God loves us, ministers to us, cares for us, protects us, even though we really don't deserve it. It's the way in which God blesses us and desires to use us to glorify him. The more we lean on God and in the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, the more that we listen to him in those quiet moments of our uh, fellowship with him and asking him, what would you have me do? I would be pleased to be pleasing to you if you would show me what you want to do. Well, we read on that the people's wickedness was great. Every inclination of their hearts was only evil continually. Jesus speaks of this kind of sin in mankind. Before the flood, there was eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. But man was corrupt and full of violence. And God was grieved that he'd made man because the sin of the race filled him with pain. And God's spirit would not always shield mankind. Man, he'd give mankind on average 120 years to repent. But during this time, Noah was a preacher of righteousness and was a recipient of God's grace and hence spared from the judgment. This is a beautiful picture of God rescuing the righteous and then judging the corrupt world for idolatry and fornication. Verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. That might be a thought for us to say, do I go through life talking to God? Is he active in my life and am I active in my communication with him? A beautiful expression of walking with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and all of the rest of the world were descended from these people. But he judges the world in verse 11. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted the way on the earth. Today, in our culture, we say to ourselves, our world is becoming increasingly corrupt. How long will God tolerate this? It's getting worse and worse. God said to Noah back then, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. In that past, God judged the world with a severe, catastrophic judgment, and he started life all over again with a worshipful covenant. I wonder how soon it will be that our Lord Jesus returns to take us to be with him, and he judges this earth. But Noah was a man who obeyed God, was recognized as obeying God. And he would be protected by the ark and come out worshiping God. Why the flood? Why a universal flood? Why drown every being on earth? Well, it was the most effective way of purging the world. It was like washing it clean. Uh, you may remember... It was a universal flood. The dove went out trying to find a place to set its feet and could not. The flood, in a sense, was a recreation of the earth, washing it clean. As the waters abated and the ark rested on Mount Ararat, Noah was commissioned to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. God is the judge of the earth, but he has designated rulership to us here on earth. And he distinguishes clearly between righteousness and unrighteousness from clean and unclean. Just as Noah received grace from the Lord, we want to receive grace from the Lord. How do we do that? We walk in righteousness, led and controlled by the Holy Spirit, looking for and listening to and obeying the guidance of the Holy Spirit as he seeks uh, to cause us to live righteously. We who receive God's grace need to be separated from sin. What is the end of man? Can he get away with pursuing life immorally, enjoying all the pleasures of this world with reckless abandon? You might cry out often when you see evil all around you. Why, Lord? Why are you tolerating this? He is patient, not wishing 
to have to have men perish, but wishing that all men would repent and come to him in righteousness. The flood shows the extent to which God will go, bringing holiness and rest to the earth. And it shows that God will judge mankind. It's a moral judgment. God destroys all flesh except Noah and his family. And why? Because he walked with God. Sometimes people come up to me and they uh, want to spend some quality time with me talking about something serious, and I say, okay. And often, rather than sitting down on a bench or something, they say, can we take a walk? It's, it's actually somewhat helpful to be walking as you're thinking deeply and as you're conversing. Uh, it, it actually allows you to have all of your focus on the conversation. That's how we should be going through life. We should say, I am walking with God moment by moment in conversation with him. Uh, in the sense of a telephone call, I'm never hanging up. There might be a moment where I put it down and say, I'll, I'll be right back, but I'll be right back, and then I'll continue the conversation, picking up where I've left off. That's how we should be living in a relationship uh, with God. So God said... Verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. <laughs> when my father would read the scriptures to us, I would remember he would quiz us sometimes. And I remember uh, he asked my older sister, uh, what was the ark made of? As he was reading through that passage, and she was great delight, yelled out, gopher wood, because she actually knew the answer. She was so proud of herself. <laughs> It has stuck in my mind ever since. Uh, you can't forget it when she exclaimed it, that she was excited to know it was gopher wood. He made rooms in the ark. He covered it inside and outside with pitch so it'd be waterproof. And this is how you'll make it, he says. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits. It's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark. You shall finish it. Uh, to a cubit above, from above and set it to the door of the ark on its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on earth shall die. You'd say, why does he do this? To start over. Because the earth had become so demonically controlled that he wanted to start over with a righteous family. We realize that God's judgment is coming. He's given us prophecy from the prophets, from Daniel through Jesus, continuously telling us what it's going to be like, how there will be tremendous tribulation here on earth, but he will rapture us in advance and take us to heaven to be with him and be protected from the outpouring of the wrath, just as Noah is protected in the ark. And notice he says in verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you. That's a promise. Uh, that is, I will not let you die, and I will not destroy the earth again. You shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. This ark was a flat bottom rectangular vessel. It was not meant to sail around the seas. It wasn't good for that, but it was good for just floating on the ocean. It was huge, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, three decks. That'd be the equivalent to 522 railroad stock cars. If you uh, think of the average animal, because some are big and some are small, as being about the size of a sheep, those railroad stock cars could each hold 240 sheep times 522 of them. That's a huge ark. Verse 19 says, Every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Notice he's given them news ahead of time as to how to plan and what to do. It's here in the New Testament. How we're to live, how we're to serve, what's up next. His rapture is next in the prophetic calendar. Jesus Christ is coming to take us away. My wife, at age five, was the last person sleeping 
in the home and uh, she, they were on the mission field in Bolivia and, and she woke up and no one was in the house. She walked all around the house, was no, was no one was there. there. They had a school for national children there where they uh, taught them the Bible and taught them uh, other issues of what they would need to know for life. And so she, in her pajamas, walked all the way to the school looking for her parents, wondering, had the rapture taken place? I don't know if you've had an experience like that, where you said to yourself, uh, I am nervous as to whether the rapture is going to have happen and everybody is going to be taken away and I might be left. You don't need to be left if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. We should stand out. This world is evil all around us. We should stand out where people would recognize. I've had people come up to me and talk to me, saying that I have a winsome face and wanted to talk to me about spiritual things, that I wasn't a scary person. Uh, sometimes I'm scary. Sometimes I purposely, when I'm disciplining my kids, try to look scary. Now they're all grown, and I don't discipline my grandchildren. I leave that up to uh, my children. But uh, I, I hope that I have a winsome look on my face. He says, you shall take with you seven of every clean animal, a male and his female, to each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I'll destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I've made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded. But there is evidence around this world of a universal flood. And it causes us to say to ourselves, you know, if God has done it before, he might do it again. In fact, he prophesies that this world will eventually, in his plan, be destroyed. And he'll recreate a new heaven and a new earth. And there will be no sea. I love water. I've always loved water. I do all kinds of things in water. Water skiing is one of my favorite things to do. I'll be at camp in a few weeks uh, speaking to the adults uh, morning and evening and in between. Well, actually, I usually get up before breakfast and we ski early in the morning when there's glass. No sea in the new heaven and the new earth where we'll spend eternity? Ah, but there's a river. That'll work. Well, Noah was to take on board two of every kind of animal except for the clean animals, seven pairs for them for food and sacrifice. Noah was 600 years old. You wonder, like, how could they live so long? Because of the way the, the earth was functioning at that time. Then the floodwaters came. Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. So it's not just the rain coming down from above. It's water inside of the earth as the crust breaks open and the water comes forth. We like to go hiking. In fact, uh, this uh, next uh, nine days, I'll be backpacking with my family in, in Colorado. We were uh, getting in shape in Idlewild, a place that has uh, a high peak. And my wife and I uh, were noticing that because of the wet winter, uh, the trail was much wetter than normal. In fact, we had water that would just come out of the side of the mountain. These are mountain springs. And uh, some of the best tasting water you can possibly imagine, even though you need to filter it before you drink it. It's just amazingly clear and beautiful and delicious water. It reminded me of how Moses was asked to strike the rock and the water came right out of the rock. God provides for us exactly what he needs. How did the earth flood? Not just rain, 
But the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. On that very same day, Noah, Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and his three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all the cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. Uh, you think like, well, can't they fly? Well, not in that kind of horrendous rain, and there's no place to land to rest. And they went out into the ark to Noah, two by two, all the flesh in which there is the breath of life, so that the, when they entered, the male and female of all flesh went in as God had commanded, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord is powerful powerful this way. He can do whatever he wishes. He has all power. And it's shocking, just absolutely shocking. There was a time when he destroyed all evil on the earth. And knowing this, we should say to ourselves, the clock is ticking. Our time might be short. We should be quick to share with our neighbors and our friends the truth of the gospel. We should tell them of the... Now, the flood was on earth 40 days... And the waters increased and lifted the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. However, it was driven by wind and water. The waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. So even the tall mountains have evidence of this universal flood. What a torrential rain to rain 40 days and 40 nights. I've been in situations uh, in Iowa in, in which we flooded. You wouldn't think it would ever happen in California, but it does occasionally rain so hard. Our backyard filled about uh, a foot high of water because it just couldn't run away or sink and, and be absorbed enough. And you say to yourself, this could be absolutely destructive if it gets into the house. The waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth. All the high hills under the whole earth were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. Torrential rain, gigantic upheaval, shifting of the earth's crust, causing the ocean floors to rise and to break up, and their reservoirs of subterranean waters to come out. The whole earth was flooded, and it changed the manner of life, even the longevity of life. You'd say, like, well, Noah lived to 600. How come I can't He live beyond that? It was 600 when he went into the ark. Why can't I live that long? It's because of the deterioration of the earth. It's because of sin in our lives. Uh, we become increasingly weakened, and our lives are less and less. So all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle, all whose nostrils were the breath of life. He destroyed every living thing, but Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Everything outside the ark was destroyed. Only marine life survived. Sin had infected every aspect of life, and this flood is a new beginning. To think that the judgment was every thought of their hearts was only evil continually should reprove us to say my old nature, the sinful desire that allows me at times to subject myself to rebellion against God, and to sin knowingly, willfully against him should reprove me and cause me to say, I don't want to sin. I want to be pleasing to God. Why do I find myself sinning? It's availability. When we're bored, when we're alone, when we're angry, uh, when we want retribution, uh, there are reasons why we feel temptation. It's within our core. We have a sin nature within us. Yes, we have been forgiven. Yes, our sins have been forgiven. Yes, we'll be forgiven eternally because of our faith in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that we don't still have within us the capacity to do evil things. 
But to say that mankind had every thought of his heart, only evil continually, you can see why God destroyed them. And you can see how we break God's heart when we sin against him. We have the capacity to do horribly evil things, and we should not and cannot allow Satan to have his way with us, to allow him to plug into our old sin nature and to lie and deceive us to the point that we think that the choices that we're making are not evil. We tell ourselves it's okay. It is not okay. You could even say it's just retaliation because I'm angry against someone else. No, it is not okay. These are acts of sin in which we need to repent and ask God for forgiveness. Thankfully, because of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross, we can be eternally saved, secure in our knowledge that he'll take us to be with him when we die or when the rapture occurs and Jesus Christ comes to take us to be with him. We'll be with him. We should not live lives characterized by sin. We should notice what we're doing and immediately repent. God is gracious, he says, if we confess our sins. To confess means to agree with him, to say, you're right. What I did was wrong. I was rationalizing and I was saying it wasn't wrong. I was saying it was okay. I was lying to myself. If we confess our sins and agree with God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. It's perfectly fine for us to notice that this world is sinful. Sometimes we just say to ourselves, I don't want to face this. I don't want to know this. I don't want to even consider this. But it's true. This world is controlled by the devil. This world is increasingly evil. And God's restraining hands are being pulled back and he's allowing it to get worse and worse until it comes to the point of the need for Jesus Christ to take us to be with him in the rapture before he pours out his wrath during the great tribulation. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How do we find grace in the eyes of the Lord? By admitting our sin, by repenting, by asking for forgiveness and then seeking to be filled with the Spirit, guided by him moment by moment. God himself in the third person dwells us personally, and we have 24-7 access to God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. The disciples argue with Jesus in the upper room, don't leave us, we need you. And he says, it's actually to your advantage I go away. And you'd say, how is it to your advantage that Jesus wouldn't be right here in person? because it's even more intimate for God in the third person to indwell each of us. That means he can lead us, that he can guide us, he can give us wisdom, we can ask him for help, we can say, Lord, what should I do? And he can give us that answer. And we can live boldly, speak forthrightly, tell others the truth of what we know from the scripture, and rather than having people with every thought of their hearts only evil continuously, we can be empowered by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Would you pray with me? Father, it's shocking to us, it's fearful to us uh, to read of what happened and how you destroyed the entire earth. Father, we love you. And we praise you that you have given us eternal life as a gift earned by your son's sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you that his righteousness has been given to us. Thank you for indwelling us in your spirit. Guide us in our desire to be pleasing to you. May we do all that you have asked us and commanded us to do. May we obey you with a whole heart. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Got a few minutes here uh, between services, so I thought I'd open it to questions. If anyone has any questions of this, uh, I might uh, 
think of something in the meantime. But anyone have any questions as to this or anything else you'd like to ask Ken before uh, we let him take a break? So I might just ask you about, uh, uh, you know, you, you mentioned where we are in the United States and the world and the evil, and just maybe ask you to expound for a minute on how you see all of this tying out. And it, uh, I heard a uh, obviously Christian commentator following the uh, assassination attempt saying it was the millions of prayers for people that may have caused that to be an inch off. But maybe just talk for a minute about that, if you would. Yes. Uh, our country uh, was founded uh, by Christians uh, who were suffering persecution and who wanted freedom of religion. And they came across to this new world and began to establish uh, as much as they could a, a Christian environment that was free uh, to love the Lord and to serve him. Unfortunately, as you saw the corruption in Noah's day, uh, the famous universities uh, in the Ivy League, for example, uh, most of them were founded for the purpose of training ministers for ministry. And you would say they're not even Christian uh, any longer. There has been, much like we saw in the days of Noah, a, a devolving into increasing acceptance of sin. Uh, for example, even regarding human sexuality, you realize how tolerant all of this world has become, even our nation, uh, even uh, some believers in, in their level of tolerance. Uh, you think, for example, as we'll see in the next hour when he gives the rainbow of a, a symbol for us of his love for us and his promise never to destroy the earth with this universal flood again, that that rainbow is supposed to mean for us God's promise and how that has been captured by uh, modern beliefs and changed into a completely different symbol in our culture. When you see the rainbow today, you don't immediately think of God's promise not to destroy us by a flood, but you think of something uh, completely different. We have to say to ourselves, we live in a fallen world that's getting worse and worse, and increasing kinds of sin are uh, happening. You think of the battle uh, over uh, unborn children and people who say to themselves, well, I don't want to be pregnant, and so I will destroy this child. And the argument's going back and forth about uh, what they would call reproductive rights. This is evil, the murder of your child, a child created in God's image. And that if you know how abortion takes place, you would be shocked uh, if you saw the photographs of what takes place, you would say to yourself, I cannot believe that anyone would do this. Uh, we find in our world a slippery slide into everyone just saying, well, this is the way it is in the world. I guess we have to accept it. We shouldn't. We should be speaking up. Uh, we should be bold in our witness. And not just vote, uh, but actually talk to our neighbors, talk to our friends, encourage people to know what God says in his word. Do you have questions? Yes. You mentioned the rapture. Yes. And we know that the rapture will be a time when the restrainer will be taken away from the earth. That is thought of often as Holy Spirit or thought of as the spirit in us, the church leaving the earth. In other words, what ways are we and can we be a restrainer today and and hold back the evil, not only spread the gospel, but give opportunity for that by holding back the evil until that day when the Lord chooses to us? Yes, thank you for that question. We have to be not hiding in the shadows, uh, not ducking uh, people uh, so they wouldn't know what we're like. Uh, all of our neighbors around us should know that we're believers. Uh, people that we come in contact with, our business associates, uh, people that we meet on the plane, uh, people we're talking to anywhere in the airport, we should be very clear 
kind and gentle. You watch the way in which Jesus uh, showed love and care and uh, actually was winsome in the way in which he drew people to himself. Uh, they were even surprised uh, that kids would pile on his lap. Kids have a way of actually noticing whether a person's scary or not. To think that kids wanted to crawl all over him tells me what a winsome person he was. Uh, we need to have a clear testimony to everyone that we contact. We as believers should be much more involved in government, much more involved in the writing of laws, uh, much more advocating, but it's as if we are persecuted to the point that we feel like, no, I just should remain quiet and not even tell people who I am. I was uh, going to speak here once on a Saturday night. You brought me in early uh, to, to um, talk about heaven. And I was still working on my talk on the flight. It's a long flight. You have five hours to do this. And the person next to me was watching me, and he became very, very curious. And he wanted to talk. And I was thinking, but Lord, I'm, I'm studying to give a, a message, and, and I, I need to finish this. And so uh, what should I do with this person who wants to talk to me? Because he's looking over my shoulder and what I'm writing. He knows what I'm doing. And the Holy Spirit, I don't know if you have a relationship with the Spirit this way in which you could get immediate answer. The Lord impresses on you. He says, no, this person is interested in spiritual things. Talk to him. That's far more important than your preparation is to have conversation with him. So th the whole rest of the trip, he bombarded me with questions. And the whole conversation we were having was actually turned out to be the best possible preparation for what it was I was going to say because on the spur of the moment I'm thinking and answering his questions. He was placed there by the Lord. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ken, for taking those uh, questions and answers.